Okay. All right, we're now recording and we have, we have about a minute to go. Okay. I like to start on time. Yeah. Reward good behavior. Well, <laughs> right. All right. It says right there. There you are. Get started. Still in the class. <laughs> all right, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. I know you're all so busy, um, but um, we will be recording this so we can watch this later. And it is recorded. So it's a win win. Uh, tonight, we have Julie Bertram with us tonight, and she was gracious enough to, um, to be willing to come and talk to us and share out some interesting information about, um, comedy, uh, about scaffolding complex text. So Julie is a senior assessment specialist at Lexia Learning. She received her master's of science in education from the language and literacy program at Simmons College and completed her Orton Gillingham training in the Reading Disabilities Unit of Massachusetts General Hospital, where she also served as a reading therapist, trainee supervisor, and coordinator of the Children's Reading Program. She was the product manager for Keys to Literacy and project manager for the Language Lab at Boston University, managing an IES grant to develop a linguistically-based computerized reading and language assessment for older students. She has worked with educators for over 25 years to enhance her understanding of the interplay between reading skills, language and ability, assessment, and instructional practice. Julie, you have a wealth of knowledge, and we're so glad you're here to share that with us. Without further ado, here's Julie. Thanks very much, Donna. It's, it's my privilege to be here, and with that, go ahead and roll the tape. Okay, so what we're doing tonight, this is a little unusual. It's a pre-recorded um, session, which is great. So members, if you do have a question, I want you to put it in the chat and we'll get to that after the event. So after the recording. So that'll be kind of a cool thing for us. We've never done this before. So I think it's all good. Yeah, thanks very much for, for accommodating me here. I no just problem. want to be able to attend to the, the chat. And... Absolutely. So, all right. So members, don't forget, you can put things in the chat and here we go. I'm Julie Bertram. My pronouns are she and her, and I am on the assessment team at Lexia Learning. Thank you and welcome to my recorded talk entitled Leveling the Playing Field, Using Assessment Data to Scaffold Complex Text. I received my Orton Gillingham training many years ago in the Reading Disabilities Unit at Massachusetts General Hospital and have had the great good fortune to apply what I learned there across a number of different settings. I remained in the clinical setting for a number of years, have worked in the school setting. I've had a private practice, worked for a number of years at Boston University on a federally funded grant, developing a computerized reading and language assessment for older students. I was fortunate enough to work with Joan Sedita at Keys to Literacy and have been at Lexia for about four years, working and supporting um, our computer adaptive universal screener, Rapid. And did I mention I was owned by a Scottish Terrier? This is his honor, Honey Fitzgerald or Fitzy to his friends. I have three learning outcomes uh, for this evening. It is my hope that uh, at the end of this talk, you will recognize the relationship between reading and language skills and grade level standards, understand the components of text readability, and use student assessment data to scaffold complex text. I have divided my talk into four different sections. I want to contextualize uh, why I have developed this talk, some prerequisites I would like you to have before we begin, a section on what I am calling the science, the standards, and the skills, a bit about text complexity, and then a couple of case studies to put it all together. So let's get started, my context. 
In the summer of 2018, the Fordham Institute released a survey that really spoke to me. It was entitled Reading and Writing Instruction in America's Schools, and it was sent to over 1,200 public school instructors of English language arts and reading to gauge how the implementation of state ELA standards was going. And the news was good. Uh, teachers were uh, asking more text-dependent questions. They were also familiar with assigning leveled texts for student learning. There were some indications, though, that uh, teachers were comfortable with assigning texts at students' current reading levels, but were unsure about how to help students get up to that next, more complex level, grade level standard texts. They released four key points. I've highlighted uh, one in black, a uh, bolded one in black, that's most apropos to our talk. Teachers need more tools to help bridge that gap between that student's current text level and the standards level text. We also are familiar with the, the other three. Make sure that classics aren't being overlooked to get to that complex text. Writing instruction needs serious attention and also content area literacy needs to be addressed. This is my only prerequisite this evening, but one I feel I would be remiss if I didn't touch upon. This is an assessment system that we talk about at Lexia and has taught me a great deal about the relationship between assessment and instruction. I have three columns in my table, a type of assessment, what you use that assessment for, and most importantly, why are you using that particular kind of assessment? So when we talk about a screener, that is ideally a very high level, relatively short assessment given to all students to determine which students are on track for end of year reading success and those for whom you are going to have to collect more information on who appear to have difficulty acquiring reading and language skills or are not doing well academically or from a reading achievement perspective. So a screener is used to identify. And you want to, the question you want to ask is, which of my students are at risk for reading failure or who are on track for end of year reading success? It's that question that when you sit in your data teams, what are the questions you want to answer? A diagnostic can be a single test. It can be a number of tests. And a diagnostic gives you a profile of strengths and areas in, in need of support. What you're doing with a diagnostic is you are collecting information, um, typically from those students who you have identified through your screener as needing additional information to help you focus on where to make instructional decisions. That question that you would ask in your data team is, what is the profile of skills that my student needs to focus on instruction? A monitoring assessment is anything, is any assessment that's given more than one time point. So screeners are often given three times a year and can be thought of as monitoring, but more typically we think about these as weekly or monthly progress monitoring CBMs. Um, to monitor those students for whom we have collected enough information that we've identified where their area in need of support is. But we monitor the question to ask is how much progress, how, sorry, how much progress is my student making? And finally, a summative is any assessment that is given at the end of something. And of course, we think of high stakes summative tests at the end of the year. Uh, but it can be an end of chapter test and summative we use to assess, has my student learned what I have taught them? For our purposes tonight, I, we will not be dwelling on this, but I just want you to think about as we go through what assessments are you using in your districts? What questions are being asked? Do you have a full assessment system or are you just using monitoring? or just using diagnostic and monitoring and summative, but you don't have a screener to identify and, and sort your students. 
So as I say, my only prerequisite, but one to keep in mind. So let's turn to the science, the standards, and the skills. Let's situate ourselves in the model of reading known as the simple view of reading. I am sure that many of you are familiar with this, the scientifically validated and often replicated theoretical framework of Goff and Tumner's that posits in order for a reader to understand what they're reading, they have to be able to quickly and accurately read words. That is not enough, however. Readers have to have good, strong spoken language skills. When we talk about spoken language, that is the combination of good, deep, rich vocabularies and also an awareness of syntax, how words fit together to create meaning. And it's helpful to think about this as you would a multiplication table in that anything that is multiplied by zero equals zero. I will say at Lexia, we think about the language comprehension as the language of school, that academic vocabulary, and then the syntax that gets increasingly complex as teachers, I mean, I'm sorry, as students grow older. I'd like to turn next to the work of a few researchers and how they have built upon and elaborated on the simple view of reading. Most importantly is Hollis Scarborough's Reading Rope. Uh, what is, has been so influential about Scarborough's Reading Rope is that she has elucidated the two sides of the equation and helped us to see the underpinnings of what these components are made of. And also how developmentally these skills grow. The word recognition get increasingly automatic and language comprehension increasingly strategic as students go through school and are seeing more complex text and more complex language and having to apply their word recognition skills to words that they have not seen before. And the goal, of course, is skilled, fluent reading. We also wanted to talk about uh, Kate Nation and Maggie Snowling's um, use of assessment data to categorize profiles of reading. So if we think about if we were to chart assessment data, we have on our y-axis that listening comprehension from the simple view of reading, and on the x-axis along the bottom, decoding. And we see for listening comprehension a plus at the top, meaning strong language and listening comprehension skills, and the negative sign uh, down at the bottom. Same for decoding. If you have a plus at the far right, that means that a student has gotten good skills on measures of decoding. And, and so we have four quadrants. And starting in the far left, if you have a student who has scored poorly on measures of listening comprehension, and decoding, we think about these, and this is their terminology, that poor reader. So you might label the phenomenon rather than the reader, but think about that reading is impacted both on both sides of that equation. If that reader has strong decoding, but poor listening comprehension, then they're having difficulty comprehending. If we go to the top left, strong listening comprehension assessment scores, but poor decoding, that is a classic profile for a dyslexic student. And then a successful reader has both sides of the simple view of reading, strong listening comprehension, language comprehension, and strong decoding. And finally, I wanted to look at the work of Meryl Nipold, who is a speech language pathologist out at the University of Washington. And she published the results of a longitudinal study looking at language development. And as early as age six, she could determine subgroups of language development. So she wasn't looking at reading. So we're really looking and focusing on that language side of the reading, uh, a simple view of reading. But students and children as early as six and track them up through 14 years of age, had typical language developers, had average nonverbal cognition, and average language. Specific language impairment, they had average nonverbal cognition and low language development. 
that those kids who were impacted on both nonverbal cognition, that's that side of the brain that looks at symbols and, and images, and low language development, those are the kids who have difficulty. And the takeaway uh, that I took um, for our, our talk this evening was that if you have students whose language skills are impacted, when you are teaching uh, comprehension strategies, they will have a tougher time accessing those comprehension strategies. So if we think about Naipold's work against the simple view of reading, we see really the, the depth and the impact of language um, for students uh, and their ability to understand. So what does all this mean when we're talking about the grade level standards that teachers are using? Well, we know that the grade level standard, that, that defines what students should be able to understand and able to do. And we also know that the standards progressions are based on what has come before. That's a progression and it's dependent on what they've learned. And we all know that our students don't necessarily learn everything that they need to learn in prior grades. So I'm going to just put up the Common Core. We know that many states are still using Common Core. Many have modified them and some states are not using the Common Core at all. And when we think about reading, we're often at that top level of, uh, of, of, of reading and the, up here, the reading literature and reading informational text. And that's teaching the strategies and the things that Naipold was talking about students not being able to access if they have difficulty with their language. And that's where this lives. The language standards are really speaking about speaking and writing, but we also wanna think about the impact, how that impacts their ability to access those key ideas and details and craft and structure and being able to use those comprehension strategies. Conventions of standard English, the, that syntax, that's understanding of syntax, our knowledge of language and also vocabulary. So this is where the language of school resides. Common Core does a, a, a little provides a little support, I think, um, in, in what they term the progressive skills for the language standards. And I've it's a very poor screenshot, and I apologize that you, you won't be able to, to read this, but if you Google language progressive skills common core, you'll see. And what I've I've tried to show is just a few of the language standards. And what the progressive skills mean is if once students are taught something in grade three, for instance, if we look at language standard three, they're going to be called upon to apply that standard to increasingly complex tasks. It has to evolve. So that's helpful, I think, to a point, but Joan Sedita and others always employ what she calls vertical articulation. But if you Google vertical alignment, that's what some states, some schools have done to take each standard and stretch it out from pre-K to 12. So that if you're working with your students in fifth grade on language, if you look at your vertical alignment of that standard, you see what that student was supposed to have learned in the grades prior. You're also able to look down the road and see what will be expected of them. And what I've put up here, this is a Massachusetts um, vertical alignment examples. And I've just taken sentence structure and meaning. This is language standard one for grades one, grade two, grade three and grade four. So in grade one, students are expected to produce and expand simple and comp compound sentences. In grades two, I've uh, put in bold how that changes. They 
come these have to be complete simple and compound sentences and also the type of sentence declarative interrogative imperative and exclamatory and then also i italicize sentences and choose among sentence types depending on the meaning to be conveyed this is the only time those words appear but that is one of those progressive skills that is going to be essential for kids to to be able to apply to complex tasks increasingly complex tasks in grade three they produce and expand but they also have to rearrange and it's not just simple and compound now complex uh, sentences which have a dependent clause in them uh, and then finally in grade four the rubber really hits the road they have to use knowledge of subject and predicate to recognize and correct inappropriate sentence fragments and run-ons, boom, you are off and running in terms of what they have to produce in their writing, but also the kinds of writing that they're going to encounter when they're reading. Finally, this is a scope and sequence, uh, a partial scope and sequence from uh, Lexia Learning's Power Up, which is a, uh, our uh, program for older students, grades six and above for struggling students. And this is our grammar strand. And that scope and sequence, it's not a direct alignment to those vertical alignments, but I think about you can triangulate, you can use that vertical alignment. If you're using a scope and sequence, that will help you to understand when you're applying your assessment data, we'll get to this, but when you're applying and trying to understand where your students are breaking down and where they need help. So if you use your standards, your uh, progressive standards, your vertical alignments and your scope and sequence to help you, um, give you lots of different ways to think about your struggling students, especially. Let's move to text complexity. What makes one text harder to read than another? Well, there are two aspects that I wanna talk about this evening. There's the quantitative aspect and the qualitative aspect of text. So quantitative, that's anything in the text that can be counted. That's the number of words, the number of syllables, the number of sentences, word frequency means how often does a word show up per million? There are these magnificent corpuses of text um, out there. Uh, primarily Google right now is just collecting all kinds of statistics on how often a word shows up. So the higher frequency a word, the more often it shows up, that's a proxy for how difficult a word will be. The number of sentences, the number of words in a sentence, the longer the sentence, the, it, that's a proxy for how difficult that sentence is. The lexile framework for reading is the, is the readability measure that applies those uh, quantitative aspects of text uh, that you see most regularly, that the common core used, that we're talking about when we think about our Fordham Institute survey. And what's really uh, advantageous about the Lexile framework for reading is that it takes the reader and puts it on the same framework as the text, meaning the Lexile reader measure in its best instantiation is when a student takes an assessment and that assessment has been statistically linked to the Lexile framework, meaning the publisher of that assessment has partnered with Metametrics, the developers of the Lexile framework for reading, and they have normed a sample and statistically linked the Lexile reader measure so that that student reader measure that's tied to an assessment measure. A Lexile text measure, that is a, a, a learning a database in which you can put text into this database, it will count those measurable things and then give the text a lexile. And then you can match the reader measure, which indicates the level of text that a student can read a text independently. And so that teachers, this is what teachers are familiar with and they're assigning when they receive a lexile measure for their student. 
But there are some aspects of text that Lexiles and other readability measures can't capture. And those are known as the qualitative aspects of text. That's the language clarity. That's how clear the author is in, in conveying what they're trying to say. Those language conventions that show up in our language standards and the reading between the lines like themes. I'd like to use this sentence to help us think about and understand the difference between the quantitative and qualitative aspects of text complexity. Our sentence is, the boy ran quickly through the hall because he was late for class. This sentence has 13 words in it, and that's a long sentence that might contribute to a text complexity, a text's complexity. But the syntax of the sentence, the order and way in which the words appear to create meaning is straightforward. Our subject is right up front, the boy. And we know what he's doing. We know how he's doing it. We know where he's doing it. And, he know, and we know why he's doing it. Now we do have a dependent clause. Uh, the word uh, because signals that, because he was late for class, but it appears at the end of the sentence. And we also have a pronoun, he, but what the pronoun refers to, the boy, has already appeared in the sentence. So this is a straightforward syntax that lines up everything in order. So it's easier to process. But let's rearrange and put our dependent clause up front. And our pronoun is also up front. And this is a harder sentence to process. The word because signals that an explanation is coming. So already the reader has to hold on to that piece. And we've got our pronoun he, and we don't know who he refers to. So you have to hold that in working memory in order to get to the, the subject of the sentence, the boy. If we add a connective word, such as despite, and add additional information, we see that the boy ran quickly through the hall because he was late for class. Despite his effort, the teacher had already started the test. We know if you're teaching these connectives that our word despite will indicate to the reader that what is about to follow the word despite will contrast what came before. And that's why it's important for teachers to pay attention to those aspects of syntax, those connectives. One final word. I always like to talk about Ernest Hemingway, who is an author who is well known for very short sentences that are very dense in meaning and lots of reading between the lines. The Sun Also Rises has a lexile measure of 610. The third grade lexile uh, measure band is 415 lexile to 760, but we would not assign the Sun Also Rises to a third grader. Typically, the Sun Also Rises is assigned to high school students. Now let's turn to the reader. I have case studies in parentheses because the assessment data that I am going to show to you is from Lexia Rapids demonstration data site. It is not real student data. And I'm going to take that assessment data and apply it to text exemplars. These are from the Common Core Appendix A um, so that you can take a look at them yourself. Um, I am going to show you assessment data from a first grade student and then apply that and show you some instructional um, ideas for a narrative text example, and then a sixth grader and apply that to some informational, an informational text example. I also want to show you the Lexia rapid assessment on what the student's experience is for a couple of the tasks um, for the, from the rapid universal screener. Also, for our purposes, I am going to be sort of popping the top on each of these exemplars and analyzing 
the data. And so for our talk, I created just a sorting table and have divided it to look uh, like our simple view of reading. I'm going to be looking at aspects of text that um, are from a decoding standpoint. And then I'm also going to be looking at vocabulary and syntax. Let's look at our student A, a first grader. So this is uh, the example of what our uh, first grade student is seeing. I am showing you only the uh, language side of the simple view of reading equation for our student because in rapid, the word reading test is uh, just a very straightforward show the student the word and they read that word aloud. Um, in our vocabulary pairs task, students, and this is computerized, students see and hear either images or words. They see three of them and they have to click on the two that are closest in meaning. And that way, probing students' understanding of the relationship between words. In the following directions task, that's looking at students' uh, ability to understand language and students see a number of objects on the screen and then they have to manipulate those objects in response to directions that they were given so in this case the student might have heard click on the heart or they might have heard before you click on the plane click on the heart the directions get increasingly complex this is the report a teacher would see on our student. Rapid is a universal screener that gives a very high level of our students' strengths and areas in need of support. And in this way, Rapid is a screener that delivers diagnostic information, um, as I discussed earlier. Also, Rapid is a normed referenced test, meaning that a student's performance is compared to the normed sample and RAPID's profile is created using percentile ranks from the norm sample. As you may know, the 50th percentile is rock solid average of any normally distributed data. Another important point to note is that in the first grade, RAPID identifies those students who scored below the 30th percentile as those in need of support. Or in your data team, you might decide to collect additional information uh, on this student or even progress monitor, depending on what uh, other data a teacher might have on this student. This student's word reading is at the 47th percentile, vocabulary pairs at the 26th, and following directions at the 21st. Let's take a moment and chat storm. Which side of the simple view of reading do you think needs additional support? The word recognition side of the equation or language comprehension? So what we see is a student with good word reading at the 47th percentile. I would characterize the student as having poor language comprehension because they are scoring below the 30th percentile for our first grader. And the lexile reader measure, which is tied to our word reading uh, task in RAPID, is 95 lexile. Well, the common core stretch band for first grade is 190 to 530. So we do see that our student is um, falling below that stretch band. Okay, let's put it all together. I am going to show you a very short selection um, from Little Bear. And then we're going to use that makeshift form that I created to pop the top on what I will have read to you and pull out the elements of the text that I think are going to be difficult or might prove challenging to our student who has okay word reading, um, but has displayed some difficulty with uh, the language side of the simple view of reading. So Little Bear begins to make soup in the big black pot. First, Hen comes in. Happy birthday, Little Bear, she says. 
Thank you, hen, says little bear. Hen says, my, something smells good here. Is it in the big black pot? Yes, says little bear. I am making birthday soup. Will you stay and have some? Oh, yes, thank you, says hen. And she sits down to wait. Next, duck comes in. Happy birthday, little bear, says duck. My, something smells good. Is it in the big black pot? Thank you, duck, says little bear. Yes, I am making birthday soup. Will you stay and have some with us? Thank you, yes, thank you, says duck. And she sits down to wait. This is how I have popped the top on the text and uh, analyzed it. First of all, we see that it is a 370 lexile. So it is above our student's uh, ability or his 95 lexile, which indicates uh, his ability to read independently. On our decoding side of the simple view of reading, I've broken it into syllable types, closed syllable, vowel consonant E, R controlled vowel team. We see under vowel consonant E, we have some sight words, which I might have popped those out and given them their own um, separate section, but words like come, have, where, and some. For those students, we know our student is a pretty good word reader, but if you're working with students who are struggling with decoding, and maybe they have only worked on closed syllables, then you wouldn't hold them accountable for vowel consonant E, R controlled vowel team when they're reading aloud. You might just give it to them if they're struggling on them. For our student though, we know that, that they're struggling on the vocabulary side. So we've got pot, soup, cook. We would determine whether we needed to pre-teach those. For syntax, I've divided uh, and grouped into elements of syntax. Subject verb agreement is, uh, can be tricky for some students. Pronoun reference. What does a pronoun refer to? Are there collective nouns? Can it get kind of tricky if you've got more than one pronoun in a sentence? And those connectives that I talked about in our sentence earlier. But I also wanna look at sentence types. So we see from this text that the subject verb agreement, there isn't anything that's too confusing. Pronoun references, there's no collective nouns. There aren't any confusing pronoun references. I do have some connectives. I see first, next, then, some conditional and um, additive. This uh, sentence type is fairly simple. They're compound sentences and I see that the subject is at the beginning of the sentence. So even the way that words are arranged is not too tricky, but I, I want to be aware um, of that when I'm working with my students. So when you've got all of this in front of you, it's, well, you have to pick one. You don't necessarily want to work on everything. So what are we going to use in our text? I've chosen those connectives because our student has difficulty on that language side of the equation. This is an element that you can teach with students. Um, and it's very important that these small words, these little words that are very high frequency, but they pack a lot of meaning. Also, as we think about our first grader, we know when we get to our sixth grader that there are connectives that sixth graders have to use. So this is the next element. This is the next portion of the text. Can you see any connectives that we might work on? Maybe chat storm there. Right, we've got next. And actually, I, there are a few more, but uh, for time's sake, I just cut it down. So you've analyzed your text. What do you want to do uh, in your classroom? Well, my... Uh, colleague Carrie Howland at Boston University, who runs the language program for uh, children, um, says, and, and speech language pathologists all know this. And I will say, if you're in schools, use your speech language pathologists. They can be so helpful with your students who are um, uh, looking like they're having difficulty with language um, on your assessment data. You wanna start with oral language and build on existing knowledge. And what does that mean? That means what are they, the things they're doing at home that are sequential? 
First, wash your face, then brush your teeth. First, hang up your coat, then do your homework. And then you want to extend that to your classroom. First, sit down, then get your pencil out. First, get your paper out, then write your name on it. First, get your paper out. Next, write your name. Then, number one through three. And start with two commands and move to three exams. Three, sorry, three commands and then increase the sequence. Create games and treasure hunts for students. I heard Barbara Wilson once talk about creating a little treasure hunt where a student leaves the room and you hide something and then students work to create, what are they going to tell the student when they come in to help them find where the little treasure has been buried? You also wanna facilitate those collaborative discussions, offering rewards for students when they use the week's connectives or whatever connectives you're working on. You can move to print. In core five, Lexia's uh, program for pre-K through five fifth grade students, they start with a simple recipe. And you can show the simple recipe and have students underline or circle the connectives. Then move to a short story that targets that specific connective you're teaching, like our little bear story. When you read the story, you can have students stand up when they hear the connectives. When you move to print, then they can underline or circle that connective. And then finally, you can cut the sentences into strips and have kids rearrange them based on the connectives. Let's turn to our sixth grade student now. So I apologize for uh, the, the smallness of this screenshot. This is what the, the, the rapid interface looks like for our sixth graders. I'll walk through these tasks so you don't have to squint so much. I have included the word recognition task here because it um, uniquely probes uh, phonological awareness and letter patterns. Um, all while testing uh, word recognition. In the word recognition task for our sixth graders, um, you choose the word that you heard. So in this example, the student would have heard the word best, but from a drop-down menu, they would see pest, P-E-S-T-E, -E, best, and bess, B-E-S-S. -S. So really looking at that b -p and the st at the end, um, that final t sound. In the vocabulary knowledge, students read a sentence and from a drop down menu, select the word that completes that sentence. What the three drop downs have in common are an aspect of morphology. They have either the same prefix, root, or suffix. So in our example here, before they could use his song in their movie, they needed to ask the singer for his present, consent, or sentence, has sent as all three um, in common. In syntactic knowledge, students see and hear a sentence or sentences, and from a drop down menu, choose the selection, the word or words that finish and complete the thought. So when blank, clean your room, don't forget to sweep the floor. The choices are you, your, or you've. In our syntactic knowledge task, it probes three aspects of uh, syntax. Subject verb agreement, that pronoun reference that I talked about before, as well as those connectives that signal relationships between words um, and ideas. Students are also given a word, uh, a reading comprehension task. I didn't show you that because that is very typical. It is a, a selection, a single selection, selection of reading and then multiple choice questions. So let's take a moment and chat storm. What do you recognize? Understanding that we're using uh, percentiles uh, to give a profile of strength and weaknesses, word recognition, vocabulary knowledge, 
the 22nd percentile, syntactic knowledge at the 5th percentile, and reading comprehension at the 9th percentile. What is that area of strength? What are the areas of need? Or let's think about why do we think this student's reading comprehension is so compromised? So we see that this student has excellent word recognition poor language comprehension, a reader measure of 665 Lexile. And we know that the sixth grade common core stretch band ranges from 925 Lexile to 1070 Lexile. Uh, for rapid uh, at the sixth grade level, the Lexile is statistically linked to their reading comprehension score. So the informational text that I'd like to apply this to is a selection called Geology from the UXL Encyclopedia of Science. Um, it was not given a Lexile, so I copied and pasted uh, the text into the Lexile Analyzer, which is available on the Metametrics website, and received a Lexile of between 1010 and 1200. Let me read this selection to you, then we'll analyze it and think about where we would like to focus um, our scaffolding of this text. Physical geology is concerned with the processes occurring on or below the surface of Earth and the materials on which they operate. These processes include volcanic eruptions, landslides, earthquakes, and floods. Materials include rocks, air, seawater, soils, and sediment. Physical geology further divides into more specific branches, each of which deals with its own part of Earth's materials, landforms, and processes. Mineralogy and petrology investigate the composition and origin of minerals and rocks. Volcanologists study lava, rocks, and gases on live, dormant and extinct volcanoes. Seismologists use instruments to monitor and predict earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. We'll pause for a moment. Any ideas on what you might start analyzing and, and putting into your table? Here's how I broke it out. From a decoding perspective, I really focused on sort of the number of syllables. I started sorting into um, syllable types, but then thought about it and I thought, okay, I'm going to just pull out those two syllables. From a vocabulary standpoint, I, I've really struck gold. And we see that there are many different um, discipline specific words. Those are those tier three words that are specific just to this science text, such as eruptions, sediment, geology, physical, mineralogy, petrology. It's wonderful the level of tier two words. Tier two words are those words that you really get a lot of bang for your buck because they show up across the disciplines, the content areas. And we've got process, divides, investigate, monitor, predict, just wonderful, rich stuff. And definitely morphologically complex. Ology and ologist, we can really work with that. From a syntactic uh, perspective, subject verb agreement is fairly clear. Pronoun reference of very few pronouns in the science text. Not many connectives. The sentence types are mostly simple subjects and predicates, but boy, are they dense. I, I really thought about these as like laundry list sentences, just adding and adding and adding. So long sentences that pack a lot of information in. So you might think about tier two. Um, however, I am going to pivot here. And really focus on that morphological element. Um, I, I focused on ology and, and ologists um, and thinking about uh, where I wanted to scaffold my instruction. And I also will include um, a little 
uh, syntactic exercise um, at the end of this. I'm going to pull geo and ology. So if we take geo and ology and just put those together with any kinds of other suffixes that we can we can put together, we deepen our understanding of the word geology. We get geology, geologist, geologists, geological, geologically. So that deepens. But we also know that we want our vocabulary knowledge to broaden. So in this instance, I'm going to take geo and I'm going to apply it to geology, geography, and geometry. And not surprisingly, uh, it's very limited, the, the suffixes, but it repeats. And so students can see patterns. As I mentioned, geologist, geologist, geological, geologically. Well, we have that with geographic and across into geometric. We've got geographically, ge geometrically. So you can really bang, double, double and triple what you're, you're working on with your students. The great thing about Greek combining forms is you don't have to stop with what you might perceive as a, the root. You can use the suffix. So let's build it out with geo, bio, and phys so that we can see those patterns across as we're broadening our students' understanding of these Greek combining forms. Of course, you can have your students be in teams generating those words. They can create games. Why not create a resource for them to use uh, to build out their own word trees and create a table where you have the combining form, the definition, and examples of, of those words and combining forms. Kiefer and Lasseau use something called a word form chart that gets the meaning piece of it, but then also begins to connect it to syntax. So you're teaching those parts of speech, making that connection between the part of speech and the suffix. Bowers and Cook use something called word matrix and sums. And I'll have to, somewhere I saw, and I don't know, I, I apologize it was Facebook or, or a webinar I saw, but during COVID, someone had taken this word matrix and sums, used much, much easier words, and drawn it in chalk at the end of their driveway so that the children who walked by would have something to look at and to think about. So think about that with our first grader and some words that have plural or you have a suffix with ER or ING or ED. So these things that we're talking about are applicable for our first graders or our second graders. But I love this because it really gets kids thinking about how these forms all fit together. So you can, in the classroom, you can have kids grouped together. You could have teams where they use the, the matrix and develop their own sums and then pass that off. And those sums have to be completed by the other team. Uh, there's some, you could think about this to assign um, in a remote setting or teamwork or uh, a paper and pencil activity for offline activities. Also, we wanna strengthen that morphosyntactic scaffolding. And this is Mahoney and Singson talk about this. So you have a complete sentence and then below that you have two choices. And this is a way to scaffold this. You might have a word bank, which would be less scaffold. So they would have to pick um, the word that they wanna put in. So for instance, we've got the blank of Colorado is noted for its towering mountains. So you're going to increase that uh, morphological awareness. Is it the, the geological of Colorado or is it the geology of Colorado? In the second blank, study the layers of rock in the earth's crust. So it, is it geologists study or is it geological study? 
Now for that one, geological study, I stopped with study, but geological study, that might be uh, good enough depending on the rest of the, the sentence. Is it geological study, the layers of rock and the earth crust? No, it's geologists study the layers of rock and the earth's crust. Also in just reading that, you can hear that accent shift that you, you can um, heighten for, for uh, awareness. And finally, this third example, um, I, I just found it in an AP story uh, on the 11th of March talking uh, about uh, Japan. Japan is a blank, unstable part of the world because of the earthquakes. Japan is a geologist unstable part of the word, or Japan is a geologically unstable part of the word. Again, think about this in pairs, small group work. You can have that word bank, or you can have kids generate their own sentences using a word bank. This is an example I just found on the back cover of Time Magazine. We know that we want kids to see these vocabulary words in multiple contexts. This was an ad in the back of Time Magazine. Seismic or small, change is all around us. So here we take seismic, but we take it out of a science context and put it in all places an ad on the, on the, on the back of a magazine. Let's turn uh, fully to syntax. And Cheryl Scott uh, indicates that you can unpack complex, complex sentences, list smaller pieces of information found within sentence structure and make connections that are unstated. Again, this is applicable to first grade as well as sixth grade and high school. What do we mean by that? Well, here's the first sentence. Physical geology is concerned with the processes occurring on or below the surface of Earth and the materials on which they operate. Now, for your content teachers, you don't have to be teaching grammar. It's a great idea. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Uh, because it, it would address what, what the Fordham Institute is talking about with, with the content areas. But what's something quick and easy that you can do for a long sentence like this? Let's just break it up. And, and, and make it almost like a bulleted list. Isn't this easier to read? Physical geology is concerned with the processes occurring on or below the surface of earth and the materials on which they operate. Just easier to process. Now, this may be a, a little complex, um, but I, I really, I was thinking about this. What if we translated it? So physical geology is the study of natural earth and then concerned with sort of how would we rephrase this, give attention to. So let's take it out of the table. The study of natural earth gives attention to the things which happen on or below the surface of the earth and the solid liquids, gases, they change or impact. You would judge if you thought that was helpful or not for your students. But it's just a way to unpack those sentences that are so dense. Think about this when you're teaching Dickens or poetry and just take those long, complicated things, those sentences, and break them up. So a couple of final thoughts. First of all, let's rope our assessment data back in. Data can be messy. So often the data that we receive from assessments is it's confusing, are confusing. Remember that assessment data is a single point in time. It is best used in conjunction with the observations you are making in the classroom. It's not the be all and the end all, it is it starts the conversation. And in fact, the messier the data, the assessment data, the more important it is for that to be the beginning of the conversation. Why is this assessment data what I expected to see or is not what I expected to see? 
And how can I use my assessment data in conjunction with the other aspects of what I know about my student? And take small bites. I have given you a lot to think about, especially if you haven't thought about it through this lens. You don't have to take entire texts and analyze them. You don't have to take the form that I gave you and analyze each aspect of it. Take small bites. Meet yourself where you're living. What are you working on in your classroom? If it's decoding, then analyze your texts from a decoding standpoint. If it's vocabulary, if that's where you're living and your students are living and the work that you're doing, then that's what you want to pull out and begin to think about deeply. Thank you so much uh, for your attention and thoughtfulness during this presentation. I hope that you have been able to take something from it that you'll be able to use in the classroom tomorrow. Thank you very much. That was great. <laughs> Thank you. That was great. Do we have any questions, anyone? Let's see here. That's some nice comments and Did sounds it, like some people can, can use some of this information. What I liked about it is it broke up the upper strand of the rope very nicely. And so you can take some of that information and, and dissect where kids are breaking down and then do some practical application in your classroom with, you know, the morphology or the, the roots or the suffixes. I really like that you know, that uh, activity, especially the sidewalk one, that, that's a good one. Too. <laughs> I know. I just think that's such a great idea. <laughs> keep our kids, uh, keep them active, right? I know. Give them something to, a little different to look at <laughs> day after day. So. Okay. If we have no other questions, let's see here. Great ideas. Yes, I agree. Okay. Very good. Anything you want to add, Julie? Um, I, I, you know, as I was thinking about it this evening, I thought, gosh, there was so much I could add, um, but I really wanted to trim it down. But it's just, uh, if I had to add something, it would be those components of structured literacy, that whatever you choose to do, be explicit um, in your explanations to students and why you're, you're um, putting the, the examples in and the, and the things you're working on and be cumulative and systematic and all those good things in how you're, you're delivering your instruction. You know, what I always tell people, too, is because um, so much of this is new to folks, um, you know, structured literacy and, and where do you, you know, where do you start? So pick one thing, like you said, take small bites, just pick one thing that you want to focus on and get good at it. And then you can start moving on to the next project, you know, yeah. that you can work on with kids. But you have to be a secure in, in at least the one good thing and then then you can move on. So yes. Yeah. I think that you know, if you're using your structured literacy program or or whatever you're using, and to just begin to, to really pay attention to that assessment data and and the instructional decisions that you're making, is that then reflected whether you're doing formative assessments or, or it's something and just kind of continually circle back to that assessment data and keep it in your mind as you're thinking about your students. That's so true. I don't think we do that enough. You know, we just, we clump it as, oh, they, they have comprehension. Well, let's do a deep dive. Where is that comprehension breaking down? Or where is that decoding breaking down? That's what you need to do. Take those deep dives. So we have a question. Let me see. Do you have a book that you recommend for us to get better at scaffolding complex texts? Wow. That's a great question, and I am going to have to think about that. Um, um, I really am going to have to think about it. Uh, odd as that sounds, I, I feel like the, the talk that I, I created has been sort of from years and years and years of just uh, my, my magpie approach and just collecting bits of information. But I know that I'm not the only one out there doing that. So I, I'm happy to provide that information after I give it a think. And I'm really sorry that I can't provide it right off the top of my head. Have you read um, Nancy Hennessy's Comprehension Blueprint? 
I have not, no. Um, but um, I know that she's spoken to you. Um, that might be something you might want to look at. Um, yeah. Ellie, yeah. Um, that that may help you because it's all about comprehension and she breaks down the task of comprehension into small bite-sized pieces. So take a peek at that. Okay, very good. All, all thumbs up I'm seeing. Great. Oh, excellent. <laughs> Thank okay, you. Oh, the, okay, the, the title of the book I just mentioned is, let me show it to you. Oh, it's Donna, I have mine also. <laughs> there she goes. Look at that, Eliza, my, <laughs> my prize students. There it is, the Reading Comprehension Blueprint, Helping Students Make Meaning from Text. Eliza, Perfect. do you think that would be a good book to, to reference for these? I, I think so. I think so. And and looking today, even at that, there there are a lot out there. But I I think it's great. I love it. I I mean, and it also had yeah. This one is a nice one, and it has a lot of good examples to use in the classroom. Also, mm -hmm. yeah. This was yeah. I think of uh, Joan Sedita's Keys to Comprehension, Keys to Vocabulary, her routine books all break it down um, using that vertical alignment. I'm also a huge fan of Project Read, um, especially Framing Your Thoughts. Uh, I, it really helped me uh, as a reader uh, and, and a writer. Um, so those are two of my influences, I think, but I'm definitely going to purchase Nancy Hennessy's book. Project Read was my first exposure to structured literacy back in 1988. And I did their um, linguistic course and um, it was career changing for me. And I, and I know they have the, um, the Framing Your Thoughts book that you speak of. So yes, very, very yeah. good. Yeah. Yes, the, uh, act, the recording will be available. Um, we have the book title and we have that. And so Julie, if you send me any thoughts you have, I can post that for you unless you want to post yourself on our site. It's up to you. Uh, I will send it to you. Okay. I know you're not a, you're not a Facebook user. That's okay. We still like you. <laughs> this has pressed the outer bounds of my <laughs> Facebook literacy. You are not alone. Let me tell you. <laughs> all right, friends. Thank you for showing up. Appreciate everyone and all your, all the work that you do. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Okay.